I'm going to talk about selling and distribution in sort of a different way than how you've heard it. Um, and it's mostly due to experience. Um, you have a lot of sales training. This is not sales training. It's really talking about sales as done by a CEO or a president of a company, which you all are, right? Entrepreneurs. So we actually started, my business partner, Ellen Flanders, uh, did a name badge for McDonald's. And she was in the metal working, and she became a name badge salesperson based on that. So right after that, the company moved to name badges. And really, that was the beginning of the name badge business. I'm always asked to share some selling tips. And I'm going to share three. One is the sales focus of an entrepreneur, so the sales role of you guys. Um, the difficult job of listening in selling, because to be honest, that's what selling really is. And the expectation of customers in 2017. You know, as compared with historically, what do they expect from you? I should probably stand up if I was really being fair, <laughs> right? But I'm going to stand up. So, you know, you as an entrepreneur, you're a president of a company, and sadly, in a way, you have to have your sales hat on all the time. You know, if you walk into your company, and you know, you learn that through time, you have to be an extraordinary salesperson, even though you may not think of yourself as a salesperson. I've heard lots of entrepreneurs who say, well, I don't really sell. But it's not really true. You are the one who's the key person for both your products and services. Um, you have a vision of what success will look like. So you can visualize, think about it, what success looks like. It often looks like trips, you know, or lifestyle changes. Often it looks like more time. I mean, there's a lot of different things to it looks like a lot more people taking the jobs. So you have an idea of what your success looks like. Um, I used to start off saying the first people you have to sell on your vision is your employees. But I've actually changed that and realized the first person you have to sell on your vision is your family. You know, and that's really, um, and it's sort of interesting because I look at myself, I'm actually by profession a chartered accountant. So I was, uh, I was a partner in an accounting firm for 17 years, so it wasn't like a minute. <laughs> it was like 17 years, and I was very successful at it. And one day I got up and said, I am going to go and sell name badges and move to Vancouver. So move across the country with my two kids. As a single mom, I'm going to leave a very successful practice. And um, had to explain that to my parents. And I was a single mom. So I had to sit down with them and say, you know, you see me here as a CA in a professional practice, and you know, I'm successful, you know me in the community. I am now going to sell name badges. <laughs> okay, and you know, when you say it like that, right? And I'm moving to Vancouver to take over the company and um, <laughs> taking the kids. And you know, when you say it, like think how harsh that must have sounded and how ridiculous. You know, but I have to say that if you can't sell it to your family, you're not going to be successful selling this business or your products and services. <laughs> so my parents were entrepreneurs, so they weren't so shocked. They were a little shocked. <laughs> I have to be honest. It wasn't like, you know, you're crazy. But they were a little surprised. But they definitely bought it. They got it. Um, you know, the second group of people, though, that you, have to, that you have to sell and they have to be completely committed to you is any employees you have. So, you know, think of employees really. You know, there's 14 million companies that sell name badges. So now there's actually people consolidating that industry, interestingly enough. But if you look up name badges, you're going to come up with 14 million uh, people who sell it. Worldwide. World, no, just in North America, not even worldwide. And you know what's amazing about that is I really believe we are going to be the um, most successful sales 
group for professional name badges, reusable professional name badges. We also sell signage, so I've sort of had to adjust that, but I definitely feel we have the product and the ability to sell and the distribution to sell this product and become the main player in the industry and sort of knock out a bunch of these people. And my staff, if you asked any one of them, they're very clear on that. They really know that I expect to be the top of the line. You know, they know that our journey is we want to take the market share in professional reusable name badges. And they can do that elevator pitch on call. Okay? If your employees, you know, when you look at it, employees are the ambassadors of your product or service. They really are. It can't just be you. Second is them. If they aren't reflecting it or they're not feeling it, they don't belong in the business with you. It's a harsh thing to say, really, but if you go around the table and they really, after you've spoken about it and taken people on your journey, where you want to get to, where you're going, they are not buying that idea or that passion, they're the wrong people. You know, and you're going to have to make a change. You know, this often comes up when you start a business because often you're starting a business and you hire friends and family. You take money from friends and family and sometimes you hire friends and family. And often they're not really the hires for you from a passion or a belief perspective. So you have to think carefully as you hire people, do they believe that you want to double your bike rental business and really think about how you're going to do that with you all the time? You know, do they come in the morning with ideas what you should do with your, you know, sweatshirts or whatever you're selling or whatever service? So that really matters, and for you to sell them, you have to speak about your journey with them. You know, when you're an entrepreneur, a lot of stuff goes on in your head. So you are always talking to yourself in your head, you know, what you're going to do, or you're talking to people. But remember one thing, the employees are on that journey with you. And so you have to bring them with you. It's hard to do, you know, because it means yet again selling internally as well as externally but as far as I'm concerned this piece of it is critical to growth and success. If your people aren't with you it's just the journey is going to be very challenging. So think carefully about that. Then, what? I think one of the ways you have to do it is you have to actually talk to the staff and clarify, like you've done in your elevator speech, what exactly you want to do. You know, we do it quarterly and then we isolate monthly what we need from each staff person right down the line, and we have 75 people, to achieve our goals for that month. You know, if they don't know what you need them to do, they are not going to do it, you know? And it's really hard to clarify it. Also, we make people write it down now because what isn't written, like when you say something, you think you're being amazingly clear, but when you ask someone to tell you what they think they have to do, it's always a surprise. <laughs> it's like you're shocked at what they heard, you know? And I have to say, it really is, sh you know, and, it, it not, and that's the way it always is. Like you think that's you, or maybe you weren't clear that time. I mean, our president, I'm not the president, I'm the CEO. We have a president who uh, has taken over our operation now. And she'll tell me something, and she thinks she's being amazingly clear. And, you know, I say to her, you know, this is what I heard. And she's shocked every time. I said, the reason it's not clear is because you haven't really clarified the details in your mind. So if you write it down and put a plan together for each group, I'll say each department, if you have five people, each person, if you have one person, that one person has to have a plan. Quarterly, annually, monthly. 
you know, and that's part of your selling. Because all of you, you know, think of a business like I used to say an octopus, you know, with eight arms. You know what I mean? And when you have all the arms working in the same direction, you're propelling through that water, it's amazing. That's the day you work for. It happens once in a while. You can feel it. Then it stops. <laughs> and you have to put all that work again to put all those eight legs going in the same direction. That is the moment you're working for. And it's a great, great moment, even if it's a day or a week or a month. You know, if it's a year, you've made a lot of money. You know, so just so you all know. Uh, the next people that you have to sell is your vendors. And I include banks in this group. Everyone hates to think of banks as vendors, but banks are really just vendors. So your vendors have to be as clear as you are and your employees are as to what your goal is. You know, if you want to be in a thousand stores in a year, if you want to have every family who has autism using your services in Victoria, you know, by X date, you have to really be crystal clear and you also have to share that with your vendors. Now think of all the work you're doing. Your vendors are part of your offering. They really are important and if they know where you're coming from, they can help you get there. You know, vendors are amazing because they have a lot of information that you don't even really know you need. If you haven't sat down and spoken to them, we now go see our vendors once a year to talk to them about what we hope to achieve, what we expect from them, if they have anything to offer us. <coughs> Is there something we don't know that's new? You know, we don't know. What we don't know is going to hurt us because our competition knows it. So what we don't know is going to hurt us. And the vendors are a really good, uh, insightful group. You know, it's in their best interest for you to be successful, right? I mean, when you think about it, every vendor wants you to be successful. So once again, you're going to have to go, and it's a selling job. If you're the president or the CEO, you're selling the vendors on your journey, your plan, your vision. Think about all the selling you didn't even know you had to do, right? And this is really all critical. It's not even like stuff that's like you can put in your pocket. You know, it's one of those things that if you want to grow, these are critical pieces. And we didn't know it all the time. I mean, let's be honest, we got smarter as we went. Um, we visit our vendors frequently. We've developed products with, uh, and services with their insight. We've gotten information about the competition with their insight. They've tested products with us, introduced us to customers. So all of these things for you are just, you're missing out on if you don't take them on the journey. It's, you know, one of those things. You're, you're trying to move forward and you can't drag people. You have to walk with them. And vendors are one of those people. Uh, banks are vendors. I know everyone's always, you know, banks don't give money to women. And, you know, that's never been my problem. I'm a CA by profession, so I know how to present. Uh, but, but the bank did call our loan at some point. I mean, you're going to run out of money. If you're a new business, I can put money on the table that there's going to be a moment where you're out of money. And you're going to have to go big for money. And one of our best traits is groveling. I would say that we're excellent grovelers. We're three <laughs> women partners. We are amongst the best. <laughs> you know? One of the reasons you go see vendors is to um, delay your payment times. You want to keep, you know, cash is king. This is just an aside. Cash is really king. Try to keep as much money in your bank account as you can, which means pay slowly, collect quickly, just simple, you know. But banks really, 
You shouldn't go to them only when you have a problem, you need money, or they've called you and said you have to sign your, your documents. You know, that's not the moment to visit them. You should actually have a good relationship with your banker. Really good, you know, you should really know them. You should have a relationship like any good relationship you have. They really, you need them. You know, so you really have to, and they have a lot of information that you as new business owners need. You know, they know competition yet again. They know service industry, whatever your service is. They've dealt in service, they've dealt in products, they have connections. You know, you should be asking them for anything. You can, you know, do they know any grants available? Do they know whatever you're asking? You know, are there any government programs you should be aware of? I mean, they really are a resource for you. And you have to treat them like a resource. And the uncomfortableness with banks, I think really, if you're not comfortable with your numbers or understanding financial statements, take an executive course and learn it. You know, you are not, go it's not gonna get better it's not like a language. You know how sometimes people don't speak English and you speak louder <laughs> and uh, slower? Because somehow you think they're going to grasp that language if you speak loud and slow. Mm -hmm. Financial statements are a language. So you have to learn the language of financial statements. And there's no time like now. Uh, there's no point to wait. If you don't understand how to read statements, what a balance sheet says, what an income statement says, take a course, learn it. It'll serve you really well, and it'll take away all the angst over that, which for some reason people have angst. Not only women. You know, people always think it's women. No. I was an accountant for, you know, 17 years. I had the same conversation with men. You know, so people think it's women, it's not, and men also don't get money, and I have sat in meetings with men fighting for money, so I, don't, I know that people feel women get less money, but I don't know. I think people who are not uh, presenting well and savvy about their own numbers and their own situation doesn't read well to the bank. And let's assume women are at a disadvantage, because people say we are. So give yourself the advantage by learning the information. That, to me, is a big one. It's hard to sell someone on giving you more money if you don't have the language, right? And that's really important, especially if you're going to grow an import, you know, whatever you're going to use the money for. In service industries, you really need it because you can run out of money in service really quickly. You know, service is either you're making sales or you're not. But it's true. I mean, I've been in both industries, product and service, so, you know, I've seen both sides of it. And banks always have more challenges uh, lending to service because there's no, not necessarily hard assets that they can hang their hat on, so that's also challenging. So, I mean, for me, the bank is really another group you have to sell. But now I'm going to talk about customers. Remember them? <laughs> you know, we've done all the selling. We haven't even talked to the customers. Uh, selling to customers is really all about listening to customers. Uh, you can't really sell them something they don't want to buy. That took me years to figure that out. And I think partly because when you have a service or a product, we are all entrepreneurs. So we develop this and we think it's fabulous. I mean, we love every bell and whistle we put on it. In my case, we sell name badges and we have a name badge system. We have software, we have different ways you can do it and you know, different bases you can buy and like it comes apart and there's a million things about it that I think someone should know. But to be honest, the customer couldn't care less. You know, it's almost like you went to a car company and, you know, you're interested. They're telling you all about what's under the hood and you want to know if the seats come in red leather. <laughs> okay? That's what it's like. Okay? 
So they're spending an hour telling you about the torque and the, you know, all this stuff that really I couldn't care less about. And I want to know what the color combo looks like. <laughs> and you have to be careful because, you know, I have to say that walking into a sales meeting is really an education. It's not a sale. You can't, every sales meeting is not going to generate you a sale, nor should it. You know, you have to be really knowledgeable to get a sale. And you guys are new. So how much could you know? You know, every sales meeting is really an education. And you have to be listening to the customer to gain that education. And if you're so busy selling your product and service, you've missed the point. And we all do that. Uh, I would say that I empathize. I get it. You know, when you finally get that meeting, you want to get it out as quickly as possible, right? You've got that PowerPoint. You notice another thing. I'm not showing slides, but I have all your attention. The minute I'm showing slides, I don't have your attention. So be careful. When you go into a sales meeting, you should always have something to give them at the end. But you know, Staples, the guy, Dana Perry, who's a buyer at Staples, said if someone walks in with slides, the meeting is cut by half. I never forgot that, you know. He says if someone can't, can't do uh, our meeting without slides, then he really has nothing to say to them. So think carefully about that. Slides are great in a presentation, but you're going to lose the focus of the people you want to talk to. So I never use slides unless I'm giving something at the end or in a follow-up. I'm not sure how your business is run. You may need slides. I'm not saying you shouldn't use them, but to be honest, you're not going to be speaking. If you get a face-to-face -face meeting, why use slides? You're now in the door. The whole point of slides, it's a marketing tool to get you in the door. So I would be cautious of that. I know that everyone wants the presentation, and that's just an inability, that's lack of salesmanship. It's really a lack of professionalism, just a good heads up. For me, one of the things that you should never be without is a list of key questions that you want to ask. You know, obviously it's 2017 and you can look up a lot about the company, but you need to know what they really need so you know what you're going to be offering them. So if we'll go speak to a customer, we're saying, you know, what are you using? What, you know, you'll always talk for pain points, you know, what don't you like? What would you really like to see? What would make us your best vendor? We ask that all the time. What would make us your best vendor? What could we do, forget even the product we offer, who is your best vendor and why? You know, that's a really critical thing to ask because you're going to learn so much. You know, if you don't know that, how can you sell them? And you want to be the best vendor because once you've spent all that time working to make a sale, you don't want to lose them. You know, so you definitely want to be the best vendor. You should always ask for the agenda items they want. So you want to know what they want to hear about? Always. That should be like, you know, we're having a meeting. What are the agenda items you want me to cover when I come? So don't prepare anything till you hear from them. Because unless you're going to know, you know, it's once again like the under the hood and the seat color. You know, they want to know what seat color it is, but you're talking about what's under the hood, how fast it's going, whether it uses gas, like who cares? You know, I mean, and I've done all those things. You know, we sell an amazing badge and sign system. I'm going to say we have all kinds of software on the internet, the internet, we can, it's secure. I mean, we have four or five thousand SKUs of product, okay, just for a name badge, right? I would say more, really. 
you know, all kinds of kits. We can ship it any way. We can, I mean, I could talk forever about name badges. Shocking, is that for I used your name badges, actually. That's good. I love that. <laughs> we, ta we take orders in five different ways, and we ship a customized product 24 hours. I mean, we are, we can work with a customer to create a customized and sustainable program, and we can do all of the things, customized software. We have recognition programs. We have products that are fun. To be honest, most of the customers who talk to us want to hear about our logistics. They don't care about the badge. They're only interested in the logistics. How we're going to deliver, how much is it going to cost, so it's interesting, I really always thought that they wanted to hear about the product. I really did. You know, and Royal Bank was the one who basically taught me something. We tried to get Royal Bank business for years. I would say almost 20 years, okay? We fought to get that business. And we had the perfect product for them. It was better than what they were using. It was less expensive than what they were using. And I was angry at them. <laughs> I really was. <laughs> you, you think I'm joking. I'm not. Ann Billowis was the purchasing manager. I've met her a million times. And we were so close to that contract during the Olympics. And we came up with an amazing program for them. And you know, I felt they had stolen the program. And I was angry. And I called her to tell her I was angry. It wasn't enough that I was angry. I felt the need to call her and tell her, right? <laughs> <laughs> and believe me, I can express it well. I have ability, I have a very excellent communication ability. <laughs> Years later, um, Royal Bank, we started to work with the Royal Bank based on um, them getting women business. Uh, owners involved in their company because they wanted to increase their diversity. And who do you think I was working with but Anne Villawis. <laughs> and one of the things I learned working with Anne Villawis is how much work it took on her end to incorporate us as a vendor. So what shocked me is the amount of work this woman had to do to have me as a vendor, I can tell you I wouldn't have done the work. And you know, you have to appreciate how much work it takes people or companies to incorporate you as a vendor. And people too, even on the consumer end. Think about how busy each of you are. I sell consumer products also. For you to add one more thing to your plate, how easy is that? You know, just one more thing. You know, or to change what you're doing to something else. Right? If you really think about it, and so that was really an aha moment for me. I started to worry far more about what they would have to do and the logistics of it and what they needed me to do so that their job was easier, not more difficult. And that was really a breakthrough for us. We stopped selling product and started working with them on logistics <laughs> and the delivery of our product. Very different concept and very different sales pitch. I would say for you in the, t in the sweatshirts, OK, I think you have to go. Anyone who's selling product, this is really what you should know. Products have to be delivered, and the product is less important than the delivery. Okay? In service, you're asking someone to change and, and make a huge change. So you have to somehow get them to do that seamlessly. Somehow you have to say, and you have to ask them the question how can you change? easily so that it will be easier for you and not more challenging. Because I understand that for you to make a change to me is going to be work for you. Right away now you have a dialogue because now you're both working together to, sell, to, to bring you in. These things are really um, nuances, 
but they are the difference between selling and actually working as partners. You're in partnership with all these people. You know, you always hear about um, the supply chain. I mean, I never really understood what that meant, to be honest, right? Like, you hear a lot of people talk about the supply chain and the supply chain, and like, what does that really mean? Well, what it is really is you sort of, I'm going to use, you know, what product do you want me to use? I'll use anyone. Someone want to try their product in supply chain? What does it look like? Well, yours is the easiest. I'm not going to use yours because yours is the easiest. But you know what? Why not, right? You're going to sell your products direct to customers, so that's one supply chain. Yeah. You're also going to sell it. You could sell it to charities, for example. So that's another channel. That's another supply chain. So you would sell it to the charity who would resell it and make some money on it. You'll sell it through other distributors at some point, not yet. So internationally, let's say, on an export basis. So that's all, you're all going to be part of that supply chain. So every layer you put on is a piece of the supply chain. You, when you buy your goods, that's part of the supply chain. So just look at all the, everything you do when you borrow money, that's a piece of the, that money is going to you from the bank. It's just where you are in the cycle. That's all it is. It's where you are as you go through. Someone's supplying you, you're supplying someone else, they're supplying someone, you know what I mean? It's just the, the, the root. That's all supply chain is. So if you hear that, people talk about it, it's like a big word. I finally understood what it meant. It means nothing. It's just where you are in the process. You, people are supplying you and you're supplying other people who are then supplying other people. It's just the the circle of life, you know, that's all it is. And, and that's all it really is, you know. I mean, it's just that simple. But the key really is, um, is making sure that all those pieces work together for you to deliver the product or service easily for the buyer. Okay, that is really critical. In uh, 2014, I started to look around and said, you know, what really is going to help us grow, right? How am I going to sell, you know, because selling customer by customer is great, and you have salespeople who do that, but how are we going to jump in growth? And one of the uh, things we did at that time is we started to look at the women's network and the the diversity piece, countries that want to have diversity. One of them is the US. I know that everyone's, you know, the US is different now because uh, Mr. Trump is president. I am going to say right now that most of our customers voted for him. Okay, so I would say that most of our customers voted for him. The day he was elected, I had a meeting at our firm and I said, whatever your political views, we are selling name badges, you know, and we are selling signage. And, you know, most of our customers voted for reasons that probably many people here don't understand, but it really doesn't matter. We're not American. And Americans had their reasons. And some of them were very good reasons, you know, so I'm not going to say whether I like it or not. We sell, uh, we export 85% of our products, 85%. If you're a manufacturer or if you're selling product or service, by the way, and you should, think it, you should be thinking if you want to grow about exporting, you know, how can you export the service? Now, you know, the bike sort of is interesting to me because you say, what could I do to export? You know, there's an interesting thing now. If you put something online, well, you are exporting because you have international customers who are, that's right. That's right. So you're exporting every day. But one thing about exporting is really interesting. If you have a website and you don't have a shopping cart, then you are wasting that resource 
If you have a shopping cart and you put something on it, you will sell something. Okay? Whether it's a service or a product. If you want to have 30,000 people on a website, you should be selling something. Because people come back to buy something. So why not sell something, right? If you're selling something, you will immediately be exporting because just demographically there is more international people, businesses and consumers than there are in Canada. Exporting should be a piece of your planning um, and to me it's part of the ecosystem of where we live you know, and the ecosystem of the world and it will also allow you to understand that for you to sell a customer, you have to understand their ecosystem. In other words, how do they operate internally? Okay, so let's take a customer. How do they buy? You know, one of the questions you should always ask is, how do you buy? Isn't that an interesting question? How do you buy services? How do you buy products? Do you have a purchasing agent? Do you have marketing? Like, how can you sell if you don't know how they buy? Right? You may be speaking to the right person or the wrong person, but unless you ask, you're not going to know. And asking someone, are you the right person to purchase this product, is not as nice as saying, how does buying work in your company? You know, do you have a lot of vendors? Do you have a few vendors? What does a vendor need to, you know, have in, for you to consider us, right? Uh, I think it's really important because you will not be able to sell unless you know how they buy. And every company is different. Some companies will buy in bulk. Some companies will want you to deliver store by store, let's say for our situation, right? Some companies will, uh, I mean, it's just different. You know, some will want a warehouse, some will, you know, we deliver every day. You know, I mean, we have 4,000 packages leaving our, our factory every month. So, you know, everybody, some people order and don't want the product for six months. You know, they're ordering on an annual basis to get the better discounts. So unless you know um, how they're going to buy, you can't sell them. And the other thing is, if they say, we usually buy with, we like local distribution, none of you should be afraid of that. It's an opportunity for you to make your next relationship with local distribution. You know, we were just told by 7-Eleven, we sell 7-Eleven in the US, and uh, 8,000 locations, actually the largest retailer in the U.S. UPS is next. Isn't that interesting? And we asked them, can we do international work for you? Is there anything we can do international? And they said yes. That was good to hear. They said uh, we'd consider Japan. And there are 20,000 7-Eleven locations in Japan. 20,000. And they said, what you need to do for us? And they started to list out what we had to do for them. It was amazing, right? Just a question. Well, Best Buy, we sold Canada, and we sold the US. And now seven years later, seven years later, they're actually going to bid with us. So seven years. Another thing is, you know, we work with brokers manufacturers, reps, uh, promotional product companies, office stationery, and direct sales. So you know how people often say, if you sell direct, you can't work with distributors? You can. So all the things people will say to you, you know, or I want an exclusive is always a funny one. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, I have a good answer for that. It's really simple. If you want to do a million dollars with me, I'll consider an exclusive in your area. So you don't have to say no. Just give them a volume that you'd be willing to do. And do you consider an area like a city or an area 
uh, you know, in the States, it's, there's five. Right, there's actual There's regions. actual yeah. regions. Yeah. In the States, there are real regions. But you would consider, like, the whole region a territory? I would consider the whole region, and I'd say what I want to do, but I do it for a channel. So in other words, if someone was looking, like, we work with a manufacturer's, with a, I, I would say a sales agency. Mm -hmm. the I'll tell you quickly what the difference is, just so you'll know. Because I didn't know, so, you know, why would you know? A manufacturer's rep usually represents a lot of different products. So they'll represent you and maybe 20 other products. And they are literally the salespeople that are on the road 10 hours a day. Their family never sees them. They like drive up and down the coast and they see people and they show your product. That is a manufacturer's representative. We usually pay those people, I think, 2000 a month. And so we contribute something to their trade shows. Okay, and they don't sell for you, they bring you leads. They bring you people that they, so, you know, it's always like, don't they sell? No, they don't. They don't. They show your product, they are literally what it says, a manufacturer's representative. They represent you, right? They don't sell. Brokers are salespeople. They broker the product. Just listen to the verbiage, right? So they actually broker the product. They deal with buyers and sellers and try to match them. Usually for a broker, you'd have to give them like a grouping and they'll get commission on it. They don't get as much money. We don't deal with as many brokers. Sales agencies are like your salespeople here, except they live in a different location. So we have a sales agency in office stationery, and we do a deal with them for office stationery, right? We don't do any other channels. We sell to hospitality, um, office stationery, promotional products, clubs, casinos. Like we have a lot of different channels, but with them, we only work with office stationery. So by channel. Region I do less often because it's, um, because, you know, when you're talking about something like Nordstrom's, right, uh, who, who, whose region is it going to be? Yeah, well, it depends where the buying mm -hmm. office is. But that's what I'm saying. Like, the truth is you're going to end up doing the sale anyway. <laughs> so you could have a manufacturer's rep there. That's what we would do. Well, I actually have a showroom, too. I have two businesses. Yeah. So we represent. Yeah, okay, so you understand what I'm yeah. saying as far as manufacturer's representative. They sell services as well. You know, people always took services on the side. It's no different for services. Today's services and professional services are sold all the time and exported all the time. So in the, in the days when I was growing up, services were very local, not anymore. You know, everything can be done now online, you know, on video, you know, it's just not the same. Services can be exported. Whereas before services, it was more difficult. Today, a customer expects you to have real knowledge of their business. So if you're going to see anyone, I mean, anyone can find knowledge and read press releases. Like, don't be stale dated on the knowledge. Like, people don't change their websites as often as the press releases are changed if you're dealing with a Fortune 500. Often you'll go into a buyer and they'll know less than you. They're always interested. Another thing about buyers is they're always interested in um, knowledge about the industry. You are the experts. So you think they know more than they do. They're sitting there and they're buying. You know, that's their job. You're bringing them insight and information. So they expect the research. <coughs> You know, I'm going to give you one last tip because I know I'm rounding out. 40% uh, of our business is done on referral. 40%. Think about that. And we're not unique. We are not unique. You know, 40% of our business is done on referral. So when you sell someone a product or a service, you better be exceptional. You know, everyone expects it today. 
And if you have done something that didn't work out, you can always correct it and then be exceptional. They will always remember you. You know, things don't always work out. There are screw-ups, you know, and life isn't just great. In the correction of it, if you are exceptional, they will always remember it. So be exceptional in your service and product, and then ask for the referrals. Ask. You know, say, you know, we're doing well with you. Can you suggest someone else we should be doing business with? Very easy to say. You know, we give a referral discount that has done well, but um, I don't think it matters. I think asking the question is key. Uh, I would also say one last thing. If you're selling, uh, smaller customers have a very short lead time from, for buying. Bigger customers, I would say typically it's 36 months. Use the women's network, like I don't know if you've heard of WeBank or the diversity internationally. Use all the women's networks. There's Accelerate is a conference that's coming up in May. And uh, we there's, in the States they have a diversity program where, they, where companies have to buy 5% women-owned businesses. We have a, have they, has anyone told them about that whole um, diversity? Diversity? diversity in vendors? No, I don't think that okay. hasn't come up in any of ours. I think that it's important that you just write down to learn about diversity in vendors. There is WeConnect, W-E, capital W-E, capital C-O-N-N-E-C-T, and W-B-E. Those are two Canadian organizations that will certify you as women-owned and enable you to go to the States and sell with a certification. American companies, some will consider you in their buy. They try to get 5%. There's a whole billion dollar round table for people. But in Canada as well, there are companies that want to be more diverse. So you will have an opportunity to offer them your goods and services, and I think that's a shortcut to selling. For anyone who sells product, WeBank, W-B-E-N-C, is a trade show in the U.S. It's a reverse trade show. You would have everyone you need to sell there, Macy's, uh, everyone. Every major, it's this year, you know, I don't know where it is this year, but it's, it's in June, but for you that would be, um, for anyone selling product, the bread might work too with Walmart. Like for, for many of you who sell product, you definitely should consider these avenues. It'll shortcut you to better growth. And I'm just going to leave you with one thought. I often hear about women talk about their lifestyle and balance of life. You definitely end up with a better lifestyle at 10 million. <laughs> OK? So just a thought, right? In service, I would say in service, you'll end up with a better quality of life at 5 million. And in products, 10 million. So I would say if I would do it again, the one thing I'd say is push it because you want to get to the point where your life is easier and your quality of life is definitely better <laughs> when you're grown up. Thank you.